In 1969, a film directed by Joshua Logan and starring Lee Marvin, Clint Eastwood, and Gene Seberg hit the big screen. That movie was Paint Your Wagon. It was actually a Western musical that was adapted from the 1951 musical Paint Your Wagon. It takes place in a mining camp in the Gold Rush era, California. Lee Marvin was actually paid more than Clint Eastwood was. He received a million dollars and Eastwood received 750000 for the role. And Lee Marvin actually accepted this lead role instead of appearing in The Wild Bunch. Faye Dunaway turned down the role of Elizabeth before Gene Seberg was cast in that role. They actually thought about Julie Andrews and Diana Rigg for that role also. The film was shot near Baker City, Oregon, and filming began in May of 1968 and ended that October. Other locations they used for the film were Big Bear Lake outside of L.A. and the San Bernardino National Forest. The interior shots were all filmed at Paramount Studios. The film's budget originally started out at $10 million before it inflated itself to $20 million. There was an absolute crazy expenditure of $80,000 that occurred every day to transport the cast and the crew to the filming location. You see, the closest hotel was nearly 60 miles away. The elaborate camp that they built for the film actually cost $2.4 million to construct. Now, this film was filmed during a time when musicals were sliding out of fashion. The film being desperately over budget and behind schedule, it opened to some terribly negative reviews. And it just wasn't the huge box office success that the producers had hoped for. Clint Eastwood said his experiences on this movie actually inspired him to form his own production company. He said that working on this movie had shown him how not to make a movie. While shooting the film, they had constant problems with vagrants and hippies who stole food and supplies from the set. The director actually hired some of these people as extras, and though they refused his instruction to cut their hair and to wear period clothing, he still hired them. Eventually, the extras organized a makeshift union demanding $25 a day payments and commissary bags of food for their fellow hippies. The director was so aggravated by the long shoot and he lacked any replacements that he gave in to their demands. Lee Marvin and the director Joshua Logan became really fast friends on this show. And Lee Marvin actually developed a fondness for Logan's two teenage children. The director was amazed at the contrast in Marvin's character. He was raised a southern gentleman. He always tipped his hat for ladies, and he referred to older men as sir. But the downside to him was that he started drinking beer the moment he arrived on the set. If his drinking ruined a shot one day, he would more than make up for it the next day with a letter-perfect performance. A few weeks after the movie came out, a New York gossip columnist printed a story about Logan and Marvin having a fight on the set that climaxed with Marvin using Logan's boots like a dog uses a fire hydrant. When Logan's children pointed out the article to him, he set the story straight with a letter stating that Lee Marvin is a very close friend of mine, and we will stay friends for many years to come. It is true that we have had a few mild discussions, never any violent ones. Lee Marvin is a great Southern gentleman. Therefore, when he is sober, it is absolutely impossible for him to have done such a thing that you describe. And when he is drunk, which is once in a while, I must admit, when he really gets drunk, he staggers and careens in such a way that he wouldn't have to aim. Clint Eastwood often referred to this film as Cat Baloo 2. And a popular song from the film is Hand Me Down That Can of Beans. And that was actually performed by the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. And they were also cast as extras in the movie. 
you might really remember them from their famous song, Mr. Bojangles. Now, it's said that Clint Eastwood claimed to have seen three different versions of this movie. He saw the director's cut, the producer's cut, and the studio's cut. He said that the version prepared by the director, Joshua Logan, who Clint Eastwood really admired, he said that was definitely the best version, but it wasn't the one that they released. The location for shooting required a majestic-looking, untouched valley, and after much searching, a suitable location was found some 47 miles northeast of Baker, Oregon. This meant that everything had to be made or purchased in Hollywood and transported in eight 40-foot vans plus a fleet of trucks to create all the buildings, stores, saloons, hotels, etc. that they needed, plus all the horses, mules, and oxen with hundreds of bales of hay to feed them had to be gathered up. Once filming had been completed, everything had to be removed, leaving the valley spotless in its original state. It's said that Alan J. Lerner micromanaged this production, overseeing all the filming and constantly looking over the director Joshua Logan's decisions and his shoulder. This drove Logan crazy. It made him feel like he didn't know what he was doing. Now the singing that was done in the film, some of it was dubbed. Gene Seberg's voice on all her tracks were dubbed by Anita Gordon, but Clint Eastwood and Lee Marvin actually did their own singing. Now, the choice of having Anita Gordon do the dubbing for Gene Seberg started out because Alan J. Lerner knew of her and was convinced that her voice and tempo would be perfect for that dubbing. But by 1969, Anita Gordon had kind of faded from view in that musicals were rarely produced anymore but he was convinced that she was the best match for the singing for Seberg. When all of his attempts to locate the elusive Gordon failed, he contacted the Screen Actors Guild in one final attempt to track her down. When Lerner told the phone operator at the Screen Actors Guild that he was seeking a singer named Anita Gordon, He received the shock of his life when the operator responded that she herself was Anita Gordon. And with that, Miss Gordon played her final hand in Hollywood as Seberg's voice double. It's kind of funny that Gene Seberg also described Lee Marvin's voice when he was singing like rain gurgling down a rusty pipe. Clint Eastwood and Gene Seberg had an affair while they were on this shoot. And that was pretty commonplace for Clint Eastwood. He's had quite a few affairs while he was shooting films. But once they got back to Paramount Studios, it was if Clint didn't even know who she was. Gene Seberg couldn't believe that he could be that indifferent to her after everything that they had gone through during the location shoot. She was an extremely vulnerable woman at this time. And this was a terrible trauma for her. Now, the actress Jean Seberg was a native of Marshalltown, Iowa. She's appeared in a lot of films, 34 to be exact, at the time of her death. But she stands out as one of those Hollywood actresses that had a target on her back by the FBI. This targeting was in retaliation for her support of the Black Panther Party and was a smear that was directly ordered by J. Edgar Hoover. Jean Seberg died at the age of 40 in Paris, with the police actually ruling her death a probable suicide. Seberg's second husband called a press conference shortly after her death where he publicly blamed the FBI's campaign against her for her death. He noted that the FBI planted false rumors with U.S. media outlets claiming that her 1970 pregnancy was a Black Panther child and how this trauma actually led to the child's miscarriage. He also stated that Gene Seberg had attempted suicide on numerous anniversaries of the child's death. The film grossed $50,000 in its first week. It opened in Los Angeles the following week and immediately expanded to 12 other cities. It reached number one in the U.S. box office 
In its eighth week of release, the film became Paramount's sixth greatest success up to that point, when it grossed about $32 million over its entire release. Although the earnings never offset the cost of production and marketing, if you've ever shied away from musicals, this might be one for you to take a look at. It's pretty enjoyable to watch. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.